energy transition from the people of the South, which uh, is a very important document that I believe illustrates uh, the dynamics at stake uh, nowadays um, that we speak about ecological, so-called ecological transition. And now uh, the current models of ecological transition impact people in different territories and geographically differently. So the eco-social, uh, the, the manifesto follow the steps of the eco-social and intercultural pact of the South, which uh, Liliana here has been part of. And it's a dynamic platform that invites all of us to join our shared struggle for transformation by helping to create a collective vision. <clears throat> and I really, um, recommend reading it, uh, signing the petition, and circulating widely in uh, in your network. So, Liliana, if you want to maybe start, uh, introduce us uh, um, to the work you have been doing in Venezuela and within uh, the, the larger coalition of people activating uh, in uh, Abia Yala, in Latin America and uh, from where this work of the manifesto comes from, and if you want also directly to touch at the most important point, or I can help also um, bring it up what were mostly striking me when I first read the, the document. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Alessandra, for joining us all together and everyone here for joining this space. I really feel very happy to have uh, such an important and very beautiful panel today with the, the different women here. I admire and I really, um, I share some things with Francisca from Latin America, for example, but it is very excited that Evis and Silvia and also you, Alexandra, are joining our discussions. We are uh, having their from an eco-feminist and eco-territorial feminist perspectives. Um, but also today, uh, I want to talk about how we built this document, which because I think it's very important. It uh, did emerge from the eco-social and intercultural pact of the South, the Pacto Eco-Social Intercultural del Sur, where we met um, different activists and academics and different uh, perspective, people with different uh, points of view, but we've been working for a long tradition on political ecology in Latin America and different critical um, academic and activist groups in Latin America. And we decided to join during the, the pandemic, of course, as many, many groups emerged in a way because of, um, of what moved us at the moment. And it is explained a little bit in what the Pacto is. And there you can, you can see it. And then we started to discuss and to rediscuss in a way, uh, what transitions are, what does they mean right now for all of us in Latin America and, and the different South. And we started to build this idea of meeting with people in, in, in Asia, Asia and Africa and different the different South, of course, with the limitations of this vision of North South, we understand the different South in the North and the North in the South, et cetera. But we wanted to, to share um, our perspective with the different uh, movements and voices and all those that joined the South-South dialogues. We had different meetings. We were discussing about the different aspects you can read on the manifesto. And we decided that we can have this document that we could um, show the results of those dialogues through the manifesto. And it's been very nice, very um, richful because um, um, of the different perspectives and that they allow to, in a way, to see the territories we are, um, we are living, we are 
um, the different sacrifice zones, known as the sacrificio, as we said in the map, uh, it's and and and, and it is an notion that emerged from the different movements here in Latin America, and also to talk about debt, colonialism, and many other aspects that are part of our critical thoughts and struggles and um, the theoretical, but it is a praxis of struggling here in Latin America and the differences also. So to just to highlight some things that the manifesto has, we have specific demands, eight demands, which are very important for all of us here. And it's, uh, for example, we want to, uh, to emphasize that transition goes beyond energy transition, but there won't be a transition without energy um, transition. But the, nowadays, energy transition is led by corporate mega projects. And in this sense, we call to reject four solutions that come with all those new forms of energy, uh, colonialism. And also, it is linked to the payment of ecological debt, uh, which is very important because for us, Global North has a responsibility for the climate crisis and ecological collapse. For example, in Latin America, uh, we talk about ecological debt uh, because different movements and organizations such as Acción Ecológica in Ecuador, for example, have been working on this topic and uh, very profoundly. Uh, also, we reject the expansion of the hydrocarbon border in our countries because um, uh, we think that green colonialism uh, in the form of land grabs for solar and wind farms, uh, the different indiscriminate mining of critical minerals and the promotion of technological fixes like blue, green, gray hydrogen, uh, promotes enclosure, exclusion, violence, and all the historical consequences of extractivism in our bodies and our bodies and territories. Also, we demand the genuine protection of environment and human rights offenders, because Latin America is really affected by violence against them. And of course, the elimination of energy poverty, because the energy transition, hegemonic corporate transition, it uh, doesn't show the inequalities um, and the different uh, the different impacts it 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 will it is having and will have uh, on the on the south, the different south. So we must stop the use of trade and investment agreements controlled by multinational corporations that ultimately promote more extraction and reinforce new colonialism. Um, and in a way, it is part of the different demands, um, critical uh, demands from the different South and the voices of the different spaces that have joined on in those dialogues, but through the people that participated in different territories that are adding their voices. So um, this is a manifesto of the South, of the people of the South. And also we are we are trying to have new meetings and um, different spaces for discussing what is coming next and how we can give um, not only to to talk about it, but also to put it into practice in different uh, spaces in a way. So we have we have different alliances with, of course, in Latin America, Asia, and in Africa. But also we are trying to have North South alliances. So um, we can, for example, start uh, talking about how the grow and post extractivism extractivist alternative, which is the way we we want um, um, transitions here in Latin America, for example, how they can be in a dialogue, et cetera. 
Um, and because we believe that without these north and south dialogues, um, it is really impossible to change how transition hegemonic cooperative uh, corporations transition. Um, we are, it's very difficult to 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 fight against that. That is really affecting all of our territories, and it is very. I mean, the speed it is being implemented even here in Latin America. For example, Brazil's movements towards the Mercosur and European Union trade agreements, for example, that will affect the Amazonian in a very deep way. Uh, and for example, uh, the different agreements that have been implemented in between Colombia and some other countries, China, for example, role in Latin America and our regions. Um, we need to, to join our voices and to also show that transitions is not something that we have to put in the future, something where we are going to, no, it's not, uh, we, we are saying that it is in the present, it is happening through transition initiative or alternative, how we call them in Latin America, and it is in the present. The many groups and people who have proposed that they are working in, in present time on a transition and that we, um, um, we have to stop this uh, uh, global transition, corporate transition, since it is uh, really uh, deepening, it's going, um, yes, it's, it's deepening um, the necropolitics, as Sajak Valencia says, and death, in, it implies death for our territories and, and also um, beyond an anthropocentric perspective you know, for humans, non-humans, and, and this is what it's about. Now, I, I'm so sorry for my English, but, <laughs> but really, if you have a question, know how can you can join, etc. cetera. Um, just to finish, it's something I want to point out is that um, um, I think this vision, transition vision, uh, it, it is uh, very important because it puts reproduction in the center instead of production. It, uh, in a way, um, follows circularity thought instead of um, the development of reasoning, that which is linear, et cetera. And also, uh, we are really uh, discussing, for example, Latin America, how, for example, nature rights are important and the different um, discussions we are having, we are trying to join back to just transitions as uh, something uh, we want to um, people talk about, etc., and to dispute this vision or on this hegemonic vision from corporations. And also, we are uh, here in Latin America. We are uh, really worried about how states, for example, are part of this transition especially assuming the role of the, the traditional role of corporations. And uh, also we are demanding states to assume their responsibility on the implementation of all solutions in our territories. And everything that is being done in the name of uh, this corporate hegemonic tra uh, transition right now, for example, Mexico's South, the Tehuantepec territory, which they've been installing those huge um, wind, um, solar panels, et cetera, different um, in the name of that transition. And that where we are demanding states to, to assume the responsibility on those projects and the consequences for those uh, communities, human and non-human communities. Well, thank you, Alexandra. And, um, for any question. Thank, uh, you, Diana. Thank you so much. Your English was perfect and uh, the work beyond this manifesto is really excellent to explain the complexity of this question and uh, the various, uh, yeah, how it impacts, especially people in the so-called uh, 
global south or in the part of the global south that populate the global north and vice versa. So thank you so much. I see there is a, a question about um, our indigenous inclusions and various gender identities is part of this uh, effort. I also especially enjoy how the manifesto really besides analyzing and commenting and making it very clear all the mechanism, the, the neo-colonial um, mechanism within late capitalism in this uh, tr that this transition as it is conceived today um, engage. Uh, I really love how you uh, underline and demand that uh, solutions can be made by communities directly by by in the roots of the movements and um, yes yeah, so i was wondering together with this question around uh, more just uh, gender inclusive and more awareness around the role of indigenous people that all over the world are protecting lives life in all it, in all its forms if some of you wants to speak about this what are some example that it's happening and especially uh, how a fe feminist lens can can support these analysis and these practices and in which way we can reimagine this uh, post extractive future hey, i just meant i was the person who um asked those questions and as those of you who know what is happening within the United States recently about anti-women, anti anti-indigenous and anti-gender uh, identities that is going on. And um, it would, I'm not, I, there's a, certainly a lot of movement among women and organizations and uh, working that way. So I'm curious about the places where you live and how you um, have been helping those kinds of, um, I don't know, annihilation of rights, I guess I would say. Thank you, Karen. So I don't know if uh, Ibist or Francisca or Silvia wants to respond to this. Silvia, you muted. If you want to speak, please unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, I'll speak now. And uh, I wanted to thank Liliana very much for your, you know, really powerful presentation and for the manifesto. I mean, I'm totally agreement with every point the manifesto makes. And uh, I would say also before getting to the question of women and uh, what, how we can respond from a feminist position. But that, um, you know, I think there is a spreading awareness worldwide now of the two, first of all, the, 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 the farce of green and tragedy of uh, the attempt to, you know, promote a transition based uh, on the continuation of life as usual, you know, relying on technological, you know, gas, green gasoline, etc., and uh, the 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 how important it is to constantly denounce and demonstrate the destruction and devastation that is caused by the solution that are offered, right? To the process, to the problem of uh, environmental destruction. So I think that this is an extremely uh, important issue: the demystification, the demystification of uh, you know the green, the green alternative, which is a capitalist alternative, presuming that we don't have to change anything in our life and continue as usual. And continue as usual is in fact a process of destruction. And secondly, the importance <clears throat> that you made in, in the document 
of showing that the ballot for transition, energy transition is actually one on many fronts, that actually we cannot have it unless we have a major process of social transformation. Because for example, if the issue of debt and colonial and imperialism has not dealt with, there is no way that there's going to be any kind of energy policy that is not destructive. And uh, you know, the, for the instance, the issue of debt, that is one of the main causes of extractivism today, you know, across, across the world. So that, uh, yes, the issue of how do we, how movement come together, how do we create common grounds, not only among ecological movements, but also among movements who seem to be fighting different struggles. How do we actually create common grounds between movements that are fighting against debt, individual debt, national debt, structural adjustment, the politics of the IMF, et cetera, et cetera. And movement that are struggling around labor issue, movement that are struggling you know, against the, you know, the, the, the devastation of nature. And of course, the other, theme that I think is very, very, very important and has to stand out, the, the promotion of a cultural revolution. So when we talk about the rights of nature, when we talk about what is value, redefining what is value, what is redefining what is social wealth, you know, that uh, you know, social wealth is so much seen you know, in monetary terms. And, uh, but in terms of, uh, the, the, role, the role of feminist movement, I think, is fundamental. Uh, the situation now, and I would only like to, to add something, that in addition to connect, you know, and uh, the struggle, you know, for, you know, an, an, an ecological revolution uh, to the struggle of that, we really need to focus on the question of war and militarization both because it is really the roots and the instrument of so much of the violence that today is supporting this politics. You know, there would not be, we wouldn't have the destruction, social, economic, ecological of so many countries if we didn't have a massive investment in a world machine, particularly by the United States particularly by the United States. So the question of war, and then war itself is a cause of immense ecological destruction. Uh, you know, what is going to happen? What, what is going to look, what Ukraine is going to look like, for instance, for, for decades and decades and decades to come. So war has to become part, a, a very, very central part of the struggle for ecological transformation and transition. Uh, I think women are, you know, this has become my, my theme uh, in everything I write. You know, see women are the primary fundamental subject, you know, of not the only one, of course, but the fundamental subject of any movement, you know, for a just ecological transition. Because there is no question the women are the ones who are most directly affected, most directly responsible for the reproduction of community. And I believe that if we look at the struggles that are taking place today, uh, for example, in Latin America, if we look at who are involved in the movement, you mentioned Acción Ecologica, and I'm thinking Yvonne Llanos, I'm thinking of you mean, Martine. It's really women who are leading the struggle. And it's not an accident that women are leading the struggle, you know, because they know what is the cost. What is the cost of reproducing family, community, the new generation, you know, in environment that have been dissolving, who have been uh, turned into sacrifice zone, who are uh, providing nutrition that is in fact becoming more and more poisonous, providing food, using water that is contaminated by mercury. So I think that uh, if, and, and also 
I think uh, that women and feminist movement, you know, are capable, potentially at least, are capable of really seeing the connection between the different struggles and therefore devising the organizational links because ecology means healthcare. Ecology means, uh, you know, the body territory. Ecology means preservation of knowledges. So the whole issue, yeah, the connectivity of the different struggle and how to translate the connectivity of different struggle. That, it turns out the women are the ones who are, who are carrying much of the burden of that today on the planet in the United States and outside of the United States. So in a great position to transform the knowledge, the day-to-day -day experience of the connection between the different struggles, of the continuity of, of the struggle, you know, for different forms of reproduction, for a different society, not driven by a capitalist logic, not driven by a logic of destruction, you know, it's the feminist movement who has coined the slogan, poner la vita al centro, no? Poner la vita al centro. Bueno, uh, this is because we are understanding, because women are al centro of this struggle. And I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you so much, Silvia. <clears throat> Francisca or Ibist, if you want to continue some of these points or add some examples from the ground from where you are living and acting and struggling from. Hola, soy Francisca. Francisca, un, un segundito. Um, solo para la traducción, perdona que te interrumpa. Uh, just one moment for translation, and uh, now we'll switch. Cari, uh, ¿te animas a hacer traducción de español inglés? Okay. So now you can switch. I'll change the interpretation. You can switch the channel uh, from, uh, in Espan from Spanish to English. Wait, sorry, sorry. This takes some, some breath, <laughs> some breath to just adjust to the... No stress, Andrea, no stress. You're doing a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. There, translation. You can uh, you can start the translation on the on the, the screen. Yeah. Espero que todo funcione. <laughs> bueno, quizás darle una continuidad a lo que ha dicho Liliana y Silvia. Y quisiera que mejor citar a las y los compañeros zapatistas, que siempre han dicho, otro mundo es posible. Y esa es la clave de la transición ecológica que los movimientos, los pueblos de la Yaya, la pensamos. La transición es algo tan básico como tratar de seguir sosteniendo la vida, porque hoy la vida no es posible con, ese, con este sistema de muerte. Y justamente es desde ese lugar es que hemos tenido que justamente poner la vida en el centro. Y ese poner la vida en el centro, históricamente, lo hemos sabido las mujeres, las disidencias, los pueblos originarios, afro, migrantes, sectores populares y campesinos. Que hemos sostenido esa vida a pesar de todas las contradicciones y los frenes del sistema. Entonces es muy importante señalar eso. Nuestra transición tiene que ver profundamente con una lucha por la vida. Y esa lucha implica también dar cuenta de la falsedad que hoy trae el concepto de transición en el relato de algunos estados. Por ejemplo, en Chile, la transición socioecológica sigue perpetuando el beneficio del norte global. Y eso es una realidad. ¿A qué medida seguimos siendo territorios despojables, desechables, asegurando la transición energética, por ejemplo, de los nortes globales? Es así que hoy seguimos perpetuando el extractivismo. 
la megaminería, con la pandemia se intensificó. El agronegocio, a través, por ejemplo, de la aceptación de tratados de libre comercio, Chile tiene el segundo granero más grande de América, de Monsanto Bayer. Se sigue intensificando el modelo forestal, o lo que llamamos acá la salmonicultura, monocultivo de salmón. O sea, seguimos siendo países monoexportadores, perpetuando el colonialismo y la destrucción a ultranza. Pero hoy además nos hablan de transición con lo que llamamos nosotras falsas soluciones. Hidrógeno verde, litio, parque gigantesco fotovoltaico, parques gigantescos eólicos, sin consulta a los pueblos, arrasando igualmente el territorio. Por darle un ejemplo, la explotación del litio es extractivismo de agua. La explotación del litio se da en salares, en zonas de mayor presencia indígena. El hidrógeno verde necesita mucha agua en un país como Chile, en que el agua está privatizada. Pero además, desde una visión distinta de los pueblos, donde hoy se explota el territorio llamado Magallanes, bajo proyecto del hidrógeno verde, sobre todo con financiamiento alemán, hay una comunidad indígena, Shechnam, y dicen, nuestro ñen, espíritu, el agua, ¿cómo vamos a dividir sus moléculas? Es matar a nuestro espíritu. O sea, no hay solo un argumento anti-extractivista o de falsas soluciones, sino hay un argumento espiritual de por qué no al hidrógeno verde. Pero además, ¿transición para quién? El megaproyecto de, de hidrógeno verde son para los porches en Alemania. ¿De qué transición nos hablan? Cuando los grandes parques eólicos son para tributar a la matriz central energética y no al propio territorio. ¿A quiénes estamos sosteniendo esa supuesta vida? Sigue siendo al norte global, porque seguimos reproduciendo lo que hemos llamado aquí territorios en sacrificio. Y ahí los feminismos de la Piayala hemos aportado muchísimo en esta triada cuerpo, tierra, territorio. Entonces, cuando nos convertimos territorios en sacrificio, también devenimos en cuerpo y en tierra sacrificable. Cáncer, muerte, persecución, violencia política sexual, como herramientas de ese control territorial, pero también de las herramientas de control de nuestros cuerpos. Y nos vamos enfermando y vamos reproduciendo lo que dicen algunas compañeras en Argentina, hermanas Mapuche, el terricidio. Mm. La muerte del territorio, de la tierra y de nosotras mismas. Este ecocidio. Entonces, no es fácil pensar la transición cuando está en nuestra cotidianidad. Creo que es importante señalar y también señalar que los nortes globales también tienen sus propios sur. Yo no puedo olvidar cómo en Estados Unidos, en pandemia, la mayoría de quienes murieron fueron de comunidades afro y de pueblos indígenas. Es exactamente lo mismo. No puedo olvidar el horror de los hermanos y hermanas albaneses en Europa. No podemos olvidar. Es muy importante. Obviamente hablamos de este norte global en términos territoriales, pero habitamos norte y sur. Chile es norte global en Ecuador. Nuestra empresa de la minería actúa como transnacional en Ecuador, colocando justamente en finanza actividades extractivas en territorios indígenas y campesinos. Entonces es importante tener esta visión cuando disputamos el norte global, entender que estamos disputando el colonialismo. Y eso se expresa hasta en nuestros propios territorios colonizados, 
y así como también en los terrenos coloniales hay propias disputas contra ese colonialismo. Y desde ahí es como pensar la articulación, que ha sido uno de los ejes tan relevantes. No tengo duda que en Asia, en África, Oceanía, Europa, habemos esos sures resistiendo y creando lo que también dicen las y los zapatistas, un mundo en que quepan muchos mundos. Y ese es el riesgo que hoy tenemos, que esos mundos no quepan ante los movimientos esencialistas, antiderechos, fundamentalistas. Aquí, por ejemplo, en Chile, estamos sufriendo mucho respecto a un movimiento antiderechos de los y las evangélicos, retrocediendo respecto de nuestros derechos sexuales y reproductivos. O sea, no es solo el extractivismo, no es solo las falsas soluciones, sino también el fundamentalismo, el que hoy pone en riesgo nuestras vidas. ¿Qué hacemos <ríe> para obviamente pensarnos en estas posibilidades? Bueno, esos otros mundos posibles ya existen y esa es la potencia maravillosa de encontrarnos en un lugar como este. Por ejemplo, el movimiento que yo participo hemos trabajado como noción muy importante de esta disputa las economías territoriales. Para nosotras es un concepto fundamental. Volver al territorio y desde ese volver a articularnos con otros territorios de manera solidaria. Pero el tema justamente es disputar ese capitalismo que es extensivo, intensivo y a gran escala. Por eso llamamos a regresar a las economías territoriales situadas. Algo básico, volver a comer los frutos, las verduras que da la estación del año. Volver a tener un tiempo correspondiente a los ciclos de la tierra. Y desde ahí articular solidaridad que históricamente los pueblos indígenas lo han hecho. Por ejemplo, en Bolivia, en el altiplano, la hoja que más se consume, que es sagrada, tiene factores culinarios de sanación, energética, es la hoja de coca. Y la hoja de coca no se produce en el altiplano, sino en tierras bajas. Y ahí lo que funciona es la complementariedad ecológica bajo un criterio de solidaridad de intercambio, de equilibrio. A eso nos estamos refiriendo. También nos referimos a, por ejemplo, ruralizar lo urbano. Tenemos experiencias maravillosas de agroecología urbana en Brasil, en favelas. Favelas que se están alimentando de lo que producen. Ruralizar lo urbano es como pensar huertas comunitarias, huertas barriales, o como pensar plazas que son para la vida. La revuelta, un proceso maravilloso que tuvimos en el 2019, nos dio esa posibilidad de concretizar muchos de esos proyectos. Hoy nuevamente nos vemos en riesgo, con una ultraderecha avanzando, con extractivismo avanzando, con falsa solución avanzando. Pero sí sostenemos y seguimos sosteniendo esos proyectos. Entonces quizás los tres grandes ejes de donde nos hemos pensado, ha sido uno, autodeterminación. Autodeterminación de nuestros cuerpos, por eso seguimos luchando por un aborto libre. Autodeterminación territorial, que puede ser desde mi barrio, contexto urbano, hasta la autodeterminación de un pueblo en su territorio más amplio. Segundo, hablamos de la gestión comunitaria del agua. Nosotras no estamos por la nacionalización del agua, porque para nosotras el Estado es otro agente extractivista, colonial y patriarcal. Por eso hablamos de gestión urbana, de las sanitarias, de los distintos cuerpos de agua, incluyendo glaciares, incluyendo 
otros cuerpos de agua que muchas veces no se ven como cuerpos de agua. Voy a dar un nombre, se llaman turberas, pomponeras, que son aguas subterráneas, pero que permiten el flujo del agua en un territorio. Como por ejemplo los salares, que está destruyendo la explotación del litio. En Cuenca, en Dorreica, en Ternas, donde el salar es fundamental para mantener el equilibrio del ecosistema. Y un tercer elemento es la soberanía o autodeterminación alimentaria y energética de los pueblos. Nosotras no estamos contra la energía eólica, porque nos dicen, ustedes están en contra. No, estamos en contra de los parques eólicos. Estamos en contra de esa lógica expansiva. Pero decimos, con un molino, yo trabajo en una escuela eh, campesina en Chiloé, una isla al sur de Chile, decimos, con un molino, la isla completa tendríamos energía. Hoy tenemos más de 200 molinos para energía para la ciudad de Santiago, la capital. No estamos en contra de la energía solar, pero sí de los paneles solares, paneles muy contaminante, que luego de 50 años son desechables. ¿Qué va a pasar con esos paneles? No lo sabemos. Y bastaría un par de paneles para sostener esa misma energía del pueblo. Y a su vez decimos, volvamos a esa energía que los pueblos históricamente hemos tenido, la energía humana, la energía solar, pero directa, por ejemplo, que se usa en cocinas de barro, que tenemos en muchos espacios, urbano y rural, insisto. Entonces, frente a esto, y ya voy terminando, hemos trabajado la noción de justicia restaurativa. Porque ya hoy no solo basta proteger, sino tenemos la urgencia de restaurar. Y eso es lo complejo. Una justicia restaurativa, hablamos de tres R's. Recuperar, regenerar, restaurar. Y por otro lado, hacer una justicia social. Y ahí en Apiayala hemos hecho muchos espacios llamados juicios o tribunales éticos. En lo personal he tenido la posibilidad de participar en Argentina con los tribunales éticos y aquí mismo en Chile, con una organización de mujeres campesinas, Anamuri, y otro espacio que nosotras hemos construido que se llama la Carpa de Mujeres, que la construimos en el marco de los Cumbres de los Pueblos, alternativa a la COP25 que en Chile no se realizó, porque estábamos en plena revuelta. Y ahí es decir, pensamos una política de los cuidados como parte de la justicia restaurativa. Pero no solo de nosotras, sino del agua, de la tierra, de las semillas de las personas y de los espíritus. Por eso siempre entendemos esta mirada de protección de todas esas vidas en su multiplicidad de posibilidades de ser viva. Y la dimensión espiritual ha sido una gran lucha que los pueblos originarios, afro, emigrantes, nos han entregado para la defensa del agua y los territorios. Muchas gracias. Wow. Ah, sí. Muchas gracias, Francisca. Sí. Very, very powerful words and very important reminders of uh, also the existence of cosmovisions, because uh, I, I, I feel what you were saying at the beginning is that uh, there is this poly crisis that all of you have spoken about uh, is also a crisis. Uh, it's it's uh, the crisis of one of the cosmovisions that uh, have taken and power over the worlds. But there are so many cosmovisions that uh, are in this struggle for defending life. And uh, thank you for connecting the dots and, and pulling all the threads also to show how our life is implicated in this and what it means to, to the link for this form of life in capitalist uh, society. 
And uh, as you were saying, it, it really, all of you were, were pointing out as this transition involved all of us on many different levels, on a level of ontology, on a level of an epistemology, on a level of pedagogy, and what we can do. There was also a question in the, in the chat, an interest in knowing how culture and cultural movements or the arts can also support this type of shift, this paradigmatic shift that we need to be actively engaged on both on a personal and collective level, both on putting pressure on our government with refusals and with and at the same time proposing alternatives that are viable. And uh, I think it's very important how all of you are putting together and unfolding on this question of economic justice that has to go with social justice, with ecological justice, and a regenerative perspective that it's needed and also to guide this process and what in the manifesto is called an energy democracy. So it's definitely a political, a political struggle there. And with this, I will invite our other guest in the conversation, Ibist, if you are ready to, to add some and bring some of the example from the geographies you, you live and work from. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think the conversation that we're having is, is, is such a, a, a broad kind of connecting that we're doing. We're connecting various dimensions and it brings to mind a conversation I had with, with, with Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore when she came to Cape Town where I'm based. And she makes the point about how restorative justice also needs to be framed with an understanding of how extractivist. The, the, he was, sorry to interrupt, but you're being translated. So please, still a bit, sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, Kari, you see Karina, she's the one translating. Just, <laughs> thank you, sorry, the interruption. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, I, what I want to really um, start off from is uh, what we've all been talking to is the material realities, but then also to think to contextualize the conversation a bit and to be able to make sense of some of the things that are happening. So, for instance, the current conflict in Sudan, um, it's been extremely tragic to see how rapidly uh, the situation has deteriorated and particularly the geopolitical conditions that have underlied it. But part of it also has to do with the natural resource question. So the fact that Sudan has shifted from an economy that was linked to South Sudan and was drawing on its oil, ext uh, oil extractive relations and then cut off from that and how gold plays a, a particularly different role in that and the ways in which uh, competition between different groups seeking to control access to those resources and how that has also fueled the conflict. And to be able to connect this also to questions about what this kind of transformations and moment means all over the world, for different parts of the world, in terms of the climate crisis and how people who are in conditions of conflict also and dealing with the consequences of the climate crisis are also coping, and particularly women. What kind of pressures are they under right now? And what are the priorities? And to be able to think through the just transition question and the ecological, uh, the way in which ecological systems are also being impacted and how that has an impact also on women's labor. To be able to also see gender-based violence and how it intersects with all of that and actually worsens in these conditions and how we can begin to think of a future that ends rape, that ends gender-based violence, but also begin to think of transformative ways that the energy systems in themselves, the way we think about how the resources are extracted, yes, um, and the, the low cost model that China has essentially, by attempting to resolve the problems within its own territories, has exported that uh, through its own actions with, within its own interests, but essentially exported it or offloaded it to other parts of the world. And so in, in the African region, that's what we are seeing and other parts of the world also in terms of the way the critical minerals extraction and rare earth minerals extraction are also dependent on this assumption of a low cost method or a low cost approach, which in real terms means passing on the true cost onto the environment onto women in communities that have to deal with the, the, the socio-ecological impacts. And um, in this sense, the kind of transformations that we need to see globally. And I think we need to be moving to a point where um, in as much as we deal with 
the impacts that the global north is having on uh, uh, on the systems. There, there, there are ways in which, um, and I think this is a, a framework that Zoran Riamaro uh, refers to, uh, but in the work of thinking about cautious extractivism and one of the typologies of extractivism. And cautious extractivism is superficially attempts to hear the voices of the affected in the communities. I have had the displeasure of having to watch uh, uh, Anglo-American hearing the voices in communities, very superficial kind of exercises that are not substantive in any way and do not in any way uh, speak to real accountability. The so-called self-regulation kind of framework that has existed and the ways that we need to rupture all of these systems that, um, and the Global North is beginning to introduce these kind of due diligence processes and accountability processes. And this is the way they are making the supply chains more sustainable in their own terms. Terms. But in real terms, it's not really creating the kind he, of. He was sorry, sorry to, inter to interrupt again, but uh, we're having super hard time translating. You're going super fast <laughs> and understanding also. So please, you are with uh, like uh, we are we are from Latin America, some of us, so we don't understand a lot. So please, please, <laughs> we want to understand. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I just don't want to take too much time talking, and I think that's why I'm talking very fast, but I'll be slow. Yeah, we have time, don't worry. We have a little more time, so go ahead. Thank you. So uh, what I would like to uh, uh, push us to begin to, and I think we've been making the arguments from all our discussions, is the idea of uh, a firmer regulatory systems, but also thinking about more indispensable extraction to the extent that we can integrate recycling into those systems that would be extremely useful. And we know that uh, smallholder producers, um, recycling has been ongoing, especially in the high-tech industry from the informal economy. People have been bearing the costs, the ecological costs also of that, the health uh, costs also that come with that. But in their own ways of surviving on the margins of society, people are also recreating ways in which they can recycle. And the ways in which of the kind of state support that is required to actually protect people from the health costs of that and from the super exploitation model which comes to the labor point um the fact that in the african region the extent to which uh, the cheap wage labor system that's embedded in uh, histories of extractivism uh, but also the colonialism uh, embedded within all those relations and the ways in which our economies have been completely uh, distorted and uh, just devastated also by the slave trade and this demand that the climate movement is picking up on the question of reparations and i think that's incredibly powerful but I think also uh, the way we frame these conversations, uh, we need to be cautious about how we approach it. So how has the reparations demand historically been uh, moving within the movements, the Pan-African movements, the global Pan-African movement. And they talk about uh, reparation uh, debt that is owed to, owed to indigenous and black populations across the world. The Caribbean Reparations Commission also talks similarly as we've been talking in this conversation about the access to social services, education, healthcare. We need to have a broader understanding of the kind of transformations that are needed. But when we were talking about reparations for loss and damage, we're not only looking looking at monetary compensation, and, and that's a very narrow approach, or a mere moral kind of appeal of acknowledgement of the crimes that have been committed, but also to think about reparative actions uh, that deal with also social provisioning and demands uh, for social goods as human rights, and as a humanizing process, and an end to neoliberal models that have commodified nature, as we've been talking about. But in relation to this, also in terms of how microgrids in themselves are being experimented, and and the question of rural transformation. Um, if we're thinking about the ways in which people's conditions of life can improve in rural settings and food sovereignty to be central and agroecological practices to be also integrated, we also need like systems that kind of sustain that. And currently the microgrid uh, electrification kind of approach <laughs> an approach that is focusing more on uh, pay-as-you-go kind of a model. So rural communities have to be reliant more on cash. And this is where I want to bring us back to the question of what's actually happening in rural settings in the conditions of the climate crisis, in conditions also where they are losing access to land as a result of my, uh, land grabbing, the desperation that rural communities have to access more cash in order to be able to sustain life in itself. And in addition to this, the microgrids having this cash pay-as-you-go kind of model actually is not suitable um, to be able to be sustained. 
Uh, so in that uh, in that sense, in the long term processes, you do need public support. A private model of sustaining these kind of uh, um, uh, interventions simply does not is not is not is not rational. It's not applicable in these conditions. The political uh, so therefore this calls on a broader political projects that we can build together collectively, a connectedness that we can begin to think about about reclaiming sovereignty of natural resources, lands, and thinking about the transformation of the global systems as a whole uh, that have largely dehumanized Black and Indigenous people across the world. And the energy question, therefore, is a potentially transformative um, and uh, in the sense of how we can locate this within the broader social and physical infrastructure needs that people have, people have, people require, and we're talking about also from a continent where I'm located is one which is essentially has a very significant infrastructure deficit. Uh, whether we are talking about transportation infrastructure for people to be able to even access schools and hospitals, access to potable water, um, and in, in situations of climate stress, how that also means that, in, for instance, in conditions of extreme drought, uh, we find that uh, there's not just the psycho psychological stress that women carry, um, having uh, no longer having access to water, and in these conditions where the crops have dried up, the livestock have perished or been sold off before they perish, you find themselves uh, women without anything to do. We know the assumption we've had is that the climate crisis actually increases the burden of work, but in the extreme conditions, in a situation, a desolate existence where the labor surplus is allowed to perish, it is literally in a situation of helplessness and hopelessness and anxiety, deep, deep anxiety. So we talked about how um, in earlier we were acknowledging all the anxiety around the climate uh, crisis as people were thinking of the coming crises, but people are living through that stress and anxiety. So quoting uh, Chinwezu in the first Pan-African Conference on Reparations in Abuja in 1993, uh, we talk, he talked about, uh, they talked about how it's more than about monetary compensation. It's about rehabilitation of our minds, our material condition, our collective reputation, our cultures, our memories, our self-respect, our religions, our political traditions, and our family institutions. The restructuring of how our economies function are also central to this process, I would add. And that has to do with the fact that since our economies essentially have been completely distorted and externally oriented, they do not work even internally. So you've probably heard of a lot of conversation around an Africa uh, continental uh, free trade area. In principle, it was intending to kind of encourage more intra-African trade and ensure that by improving um, the theory, you improve your capacity to be able to produce. And if we're thinking of production along the lines of agro-industrial production that's more ecologically sustainable, you still need to be able to also create energy systems that can sustain that. And to be able to also create a basis where you have the technical capacity also growing alongside it to ensure that microgrids and all these uh, systems energy systems are actually maintained uh, within the without being externally dependent. And all of this requires literally rebuilding your economies from scratch to ensure that you have a greater sharing and gr a greater um, equitable kind of and rational kind of economic relations, social relations that emerge around this, as opposed to what we have now, which is one dominated by the imperialist capitalist systems of accumulation. And it would mean shifting our economies that, for instance, overvalue commodities like gold and diamonds to one that focuses on materials that are used for decent housing, schools, roads, and access to renewable energy. And therefore, moving from a model that is essentially predict predatory uh, extractivism to one that is more restrictive, regulated, and very restricted and focused. Um, one that discards a system that's based on cheap wage labor and on the, the, the super exploitation of unpaid work and the disruption and disposability of humans and ecosystems as we've all discussed in this space. And um, the, and then it's even on its own terms, as we all know, it's been unsustainable, but to one that is more humane. Um, and I, I would like to also emphasize again that um, as feminists, we do understand the centrality of unpaid labor in, in wealth creation and the importance also of cultural rights and defending the commons and working towards a decommodification of nature, nature that are important fronts in this quest for gender, economic and ecological justice. 
But uh, the demands for justice, although are directed to the global north, we need to also begin to uh, more overtly engage with the global south for more coherence. Um, and if it's a question of beginning to build uh, a people's non-aligned movement that is also very clear and direct and also engaging with powers like China directly in terms of the kind of uh, standards that are expected from not just the way it invests within its own uh, elsewhere, but also in terms of the lessons that it's had in terms of the unsustainability of the model that has devastated its own uh, territories and its own uh, impacted the health situation and the environment and social conditions within China itself. And this should be leading to a different kind of model. Uh, and then one that uh, begins to uh, have a more restrained approach. And I think that uh, to, to have a non-aligned kind of movement that we can begin to advance that from a way that doesn't get caught up necessarily in this geopolitical kind of a drama, but instead begins to uh, advance an autonomous movement that is, of course, against war in all forms and in, uh, and in the ways in which the global South has been sucked into it, uh, particularly as we're seeing uh, ever so tragic in, in Sudan. Uh, and this is important for us to be able to begin to assert autonomy of our resources, to begin to also make demands uh, for sovereignty and the idea that we can have a completely different vision. And in relation to this, I just want to close off with what was said earlier about delinking. I think delinking is incredibly powerful conceptually, um, advanced primarily in Africa by Samir Amin, and in many ways also taken and in, for some years actually had been uh, ignored. And I think it's necessary to begin to rethink of those uh, frameworks and approaches, but begin to advance them uh, analytically and politically in ways that make sense in the current contemporary problems. And I think part of it has to do with the smallholder produ producer, raising questions that centralize the interests of smallholder producers and not those of corporations, not those of, of, of governments that have been embedded in those relations and essentially co-opted by them and beginning to advance alternatives, concrete alternatives that begin to show the ways in which people can, we can restructure our economies and ensure that there's greater harmony with the ecology, but also understanding that there will be compromise down the line and knowing the lines where we will draw those compromises. And I don't pretend to know where all the lines of compromise will be, uh, but I think South Africa offers an excellent example of how things can go array uh, in terms of advancing a just energy, a renewable energy kind of approach to uh, restructuring the energy systems, but not factoring in uh, the exact productive capacity needs and demands and kind of decline that can also result from that in an energy crisis that we're sitting with. It's a very practical, immediate and considerate approach that needs to be taken. And in our case, uh, it's a very strange kind of scenario where essentially the corporate model, uh, the renewable energy is the corporate model of approaching to uh, shifting economies and the ways in which we can restructure it um, to actually meet demand and an unmet a demand from population, particularly historically racialized excluded populations and the phenomenon of energy racism that is even found in terms of the way energy existing being produced and even a, on the basis of coal is distributed on racial lines and therefore uh, requiring different approaches to be able to deal with the historical legacy of how accumulation has taken place, but also a forward looking approach that ensures they actually respond to those issues while charting uh, a different model of energy generation distribution. And uh, in that sense, it's it's it, they are not easy answers to this, but I think that's part of the issues that we also we'd, we have to confront. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibis, for, for adding more layers. It's very hard to, to navigate these complex times and all uh, your perspectives really help to unfold uh, these questions with such um, depth. I'm really grateful for all of your knowledge. And uh, I would invite you all to please maybe write on the chats uh, the people you have quoted, uh, their names or their writings or their sentences, uh, and to also not be shy and post uh, some of your writing in which you are, you are um, articulating all these that you have shared with us today, we know Time is never enough to, to unfold on these questions. And maybe in this way, we can help those who were having a little bit of um, trouble with languages to take the time. These are 
these are a space for us to continue self document self inform each other and uh, and learn together so please uh, um this is called vamos post, a ir aprendiendo juntas entonces post some of your writing and thank you so much for the translators who have been helping out this dialogue i want to ask andrea how much time we have left to see if we can maybe allow someone from the participant to to share comments, questions, experience, or any feedback or mm -hmm. any, any of their work that they're doing in other location. Andrea, what I, I know we need the, the, the room for another conference next. Do we know how much time we have? Maybe Andrea is not there, so I would say- uh, She said 15 minutes. 15. 15. Oh, okay. Great. So I would leave uh, the, the floor open to those who were participating. If you have any questions or further comments or example you want to bring, or if you have any question to any of the specific uh, contributors that have been with us. Also, Silvia, if you have to go and you want to share some uh, closing comments, you can unmute yourself. Please go ahead. We know you have to go. Yeah, my, my closing comments are to say how moved and how powerful the presentation has been. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm very, and uh, my main question. Uh, you hear me? Yeah, my main question is how we can uh, circulate what is going to happen with what Liliana, what Francisca, what Ishtar have said, so that we can actually digest them, use them, and, and uh, you know, move on with this conversation. Because uh, I've become more and more um, concerned that often, this encounter have a kind of episodic quality. And I really think that important of keeping connected and continuing and learning. So I like to be able to continue to understand and connect with the work that you all are doing and, uh, and sharing and continue this discussion. So these are really my, my final words because I think that a lot was said. It was fundamental, really. We all want a different world. We need a different world. Capitalism is destroying our life everywhere and, and in the form particularly of American and Chinese imperialism. I think American imperialism is probably the main threat to the world uh, you know, future, uh, but also it be illusion to think as some do today, that for example, China is an alternative. And I think uh, it's very important that we continue, that we now build this common ground, not only in the places where we are, but internationally. I'd like, for example, to be able to, to re-listen re to this or to, and I, it would be great, for example, to have a, a, a pamphlet, a booklet with what was said today. I think that this will be, you know, uh, some is very, very powerful. And uh, although we all know the general issue, although we know the general issue, but actually there's a lot of that, yeah. And today I've learned. Thank yeah. you, Cindy. I think you, you're saying something that all of us have felt um, during this conversation. And as part of the publication and multimedia service circle of the Ecoversity Alliance, I will take this invitation forward and I think we will transcribe and maybe publish uh, uh, and re-edit with all of you so we can continue also be fantastic. conversation through text and that's another way to connect and um, yeah and this uh, is being recording it will be edited a bit and recirculated through the ecoversity channels and all of our connected networks i see many hands raised victoria katarina and on the chat there is a wish to understand more what we mean when we speak about delinking
we have 10 minutes if you can um, make your comments Victoria or Katarina briefly considering that we have a, just this little time now Hi, I'm Victoria from Mexico, from the Universidad del Medio Ambiente, University of the Environment. And I was wondering if, uh, if there is any um, line of inquiry uh, within uh, your, your movements in terms of one uh, assumption uh, even further back, which is, do we need energy transition? So we've been speaking about uh, energy transition being made in in a non-optimal way to say it very <laughs> diplomatically. Uh, uh, um, but is, there, is this question alive? Uh, some of us uh, have been uh, uh, researching uh, the idea of uh, the, the hypothesis that uh, CO2 is uh, the cause of um, climate change versus the hypothesis that is a natural cause. And I think there's a very interesting scientific discussion going on there. And uh, I think that if we remove from these inquiries the basic question, which is if we need this, uh, then we, we are uh, losing, uh, in my perspective, a big chunk of what might be going on. Because if we actually don't even need it, then everything that has been spoken, it's even worse, even really, really worse, right? Uh, so I, I would love to hear if, if this question is alive. For you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And I will take Katarina also questions. So maybe putting together the question, you will decide who can answer to this. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, discussion. Super, super interesting um, and to be digested, definitely. And uh, what I was wondering is um, also, I mean, me coming from a um, a global North country with a former colonial history as well, still happening, of course, um, in this capitalist system. I am wondering also, since this, all these transitions that we are talking about will take time because they are systemic, so they will take their time. Uh, I have a very specific example here in Portugal that's causing a lot of questions for me, which is, they are starting to mine for lithium in Portugal. And uh, my question is, since we want to stop exporting the, um, the mining or extractivism to the global south, as we have been talking here, should we allow then mining to happen for now in the global north as an example uh, in this time of transition? Or should we stand for what we believe is in which is no extractivism and yeah but what do we do in the meantime basically because we still use cell phones we're not today going to drop our cell phones in the ocean so what do we do until then this is my question and thank you so much <laughs> thank you victoria and katarina and again there was a question about delinking if someone can explain or make it more yeah. yeah, I'd like to step in, please. So uh, I think when I uh, earlier spoke, uh, they, I may have, uh, well, let's be put it this way. In the African continent, that we have, uh, there's a lot of anger uh, that usually is expressed towards China in particular. And usually what we don't do is analyze the kind of regimes that have been in place how long they've been set up, the kind of liberalization we've undergone, and the context within which particular forms of investments from China are having particular impacts on the continent, and then re-rationalizing, regulating, and improving our systems so that we can engage with all parties, whether coming from the global north or China. So my attempt is to articulate a position that begins to define what an autonomous development strategy can be, but centering the interests of smallholder producers. And this is the point about delinking that I think begins to make relevance, is that the, the relationships were essentially locked into uh, are extractivist in nature. They reproduce particular sets of relations. We are not able to trade and exchange in ways that actually make sense for our economies, but rather make sense for the corporates. So for instance, there's the export of uh, lithium uh, from Malawi, for instance, that goes directly to Germany, things like that. 
So uh, the kind of relations that essentially set up this extractivist model, as opposed to what Zimbabwe, for instance, try to do is to control the export of uh, raw forms of uh, minerals or, or lithium specifically, because it has one of the largest reserves globally of lithium reserves to, to prevent it, unless uh, that uh, there's processing taking place within Zimbabwe. So he, Comparatively speaking, that is at least some degree of a, a, a slight, an important shift historically. However, um, the point that was being made earlier by uh, Katarina, I think it's absolutely uh, relevant to consider. Lithium mining is extremely uh, uh, lethal in terms of its impacts on water systems. And uh, it's uh, the need to be able to have alternatives to this particular form is very important. And uh, when you look at the particular model that China itself implemented within its own economy, it's been destructive. Um, so it's it's also a question of the extent, the kind of methods that you're using and the cost of production. The lower the cost of production, the more the impact on ecology. It's cheaper for the corporates to be able to approach that form of uh, production. And therefore it makes sense for them, especially if you have a liberalized uh, system. So when you come to the Africa region, uh, in, in many of the countries, we have liberalized mining regimes pushed through by the World Bank. Uh, that basically make it easier for corporates. And of course, our um, uh, environmental uh, protection agencies are poorly resourced. So they're not even able to even monitor what the big corporations are doing, let alone artisanal miners who are like uh, operating on the margins of the economy, but feeding into a super exploitative system that is creating like uh, access to uh, uh, cheap minerals, cheapened minerals, but at a very high cost. So... Um, the question is then what kind of approach to extra, it's a very difficult one. And this is where I'm saying that some degree of compromise would be necessary in the interim, as we're also trying to shift and develop better forms of extraction, better forms of mineral uh, extraction that uh, do not have as much of an impact on the environment and inequalities on human costs. Um, there's also the question of consent. Consent is extremely important because it's a political question then. What kind of development choices do people have and the extent to which they can engage on a project, not just at, as when it is beginning to approve it, but as an ongoing process uh, throughout the whole process of uh, production. And people's rights to also say no altogether and to reject that model of development. In Madagascar, you had 3,000 people marching at the end of February, uh, rejecting uh, uh, rare earth mineral exploitation. And these are smallholder producers, fisher folk, farmers, the youth, women's groups, all together. Um, but the question still remains, how do you improve the quality of life for the for the ordinary Madag Malagasy, where the, the 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 unemployment rate is so low, not because people are not for, looking for work, but they've lost hope in searching for work, uh, where the access to cash is, is such a desperate situation for people, where because they've been excluded in many ways and yet are so dependent on the system, and even to send their children to to school, they have to pay. So uh, because of the nature of the system, it doesn't even make that form of life, uh, if you will, uh, ideal, even though the environment and nature is beautiful and we can praise uh, the, the way Madagascar, um, uh, its, its own ecological diversity, it's really important to protect. Uh, but in what ways can the quality of life of people be improved? And I think that's still an open question. much i'm happy i just found out there will be not another panel after us so we could go over another 10 minutes if people wants to stay longer and if any of you wants to address these questions that were posed or if anyone has any other urgent questions i would like to say something i i think what um Veronica was saying it's very important because we need counter narrative, we need alternative research uh, on, for example, carbon centered policies and uh, decarbonization process, which is based on false solutions and how they are uh, colonizing and um, greenwashing, greenwashed language that emerged from the Carbonisa decarbonization uh, culture all around. And even we are so centered as movements on 
decarbonizing society, etc., that we forget what is um, at the base of the crisis. We, um, and there is something I would like to point out is the how, for example, transition or the new transition, because it is, it is an old debate, uh, but um, this new transition based on new materials, uh, a new materials para para paradigm um, um, based on lithium, hydrogen, etc. cetera, uh, it's in a way uh, uh, forcing a movement from what, for example, yeah, our analysis, even on the crisis, uh, the different crises, uh, because we don't talk, for example, uh, of uh, civilization crisis and uh, the transformations we need on the different levels. Uh, even we are so, I mean, when I say we, it's about, I mean, global uh, hegemonic movements that are trying to fight, for example, in some spaces as cops, uh, we can criticize cops and how they divide everything biodiversity, climate, cup, uh, cup even, I mean, the, we it, everything is divided. So they keep, try to keep us divided also. So what we are trying to propose is that we, we, we need to reconnect all those aspects, those spheres, and talk about biodiversity loss, climate change, um, um, uh, gender injustices, I mean, as part of the same uh, in a whole and reconnect all the, those aspects and spheres in a way. And for example, there was a question about the role of art, the role of uh, new languages. And of course, we need to move uh, um, towards finding new ways of saying what we're really thinking about. And, and this is very important at this moment. And uh, I think we are, we are in country and we are having a lot of, um, of uh, yes, of agreements on that um, in the different South and in the different North also. And of course, we, uh, I think it is very nice and powerful. This space is uh, very powerful. And also we, we want to, to keep moving in the spreading of the manifesto, not, not because of the document itself, but the process behind the manifesto and the different encounters it is generated, as this one, for example, which I find very powerful, uh, to give, um, um, uh, uh, for example, a feminist perspective and uh, from the different struggles and, and spaces to give it different readings, for example, uh, and keep encountering each other and having these encounters also. Thank you, Liliana. Caicedo, do you want to say something? <clears throat> you have to unmute yourself. Try one more. Hola, buenos dias. Thank you. Uh, good morning for everyone from here. Um, I, Liliana, uh, how to kind of share the manifesto or is there a hoja de ruta or kind of plan suggestions of how to keep sharing the manifesto or building events around it? Is there anything out there that we can look at or it's a little bit up to us to, you know, bring this manifesto to the center and forward? I'm curious if there's any kind of guidelines along with the manifesto. Well, we are moving to us those, these types of meetings, but also in countries, uh, for example, we are meeting right now um, between the people who, who build the manifesto in order to, to see which are the next actions. And of course, as we are a diversity with many perspectives and also to go from different pathways, trying to, um, for example, we are having um, a self self dialogue among energy communities, for example, energetic communities or comunidades energeticas. Um, he, and so we are trying to keep on those dialogues um, step by step and trying to, to, 
of course, it depends on the initiative that try to assume the manifest and, and try to work on it. And it is open to proposals. It is open to ideas around the, the, um, around the, um, the manifesto. And also it's a call. As you can notice in the manifesto at the very beginning, there is a call for all of you, for, for people to propose things, take the document, transform it, try to, um, to, 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 to build dialogues and spaces, alternative spaces for dialogue, etc. cetera. Um, for example, yes, we have an alliance with the GTA uh, and the different spaces. Okay, and now Ecoversity is, is part of our allies and we are trying to build small, uh, different spaces uh, but this is the way how we we are proposing it could work by people's proposals and trying to keep moving um, step by step by having uh, a community based spaces, but also dialogues with, uh, for example, spaces where we think uh, public policies can be uh, promoted towards just transitions. Um, and in our case, uh, in Venezuela, for example, because Pacto Social has different, um, let's see, chapters or spaces. I mean, we work by, by countries. Uh, we are facing such a crisis based on dependence of fuel, uh, fossil fuels, a very deep, deep one that it's a very good example of, uh, um, of how resistance is to the, so to extractivism um, can, can think about just transitions in these countries, for example. So um, every space has its own interpretation of transition initiative or alternative, as we call them in uh, post-extractive, futures and alternative, how we call them in Latin America. And yes, we are trying to work on those proposals step by step and by people's proposals also. I mean, what what uh, do you want to do with the document? And, and we are meeting very soon. So there's our page and uh, we have uh, alliances with the GTA, the ISPS, the, TNI, the different different spaces that are really interested uh, on this um, document, but also the process behind. So thank you very much for this space and the invitation and this wonderful encounter and for being all uh, here in this space also. I, I have a question. Um, in this discussion, I'd like to know how in this discussion of post-extractivist future, the issue of the digital economy and the things that we use is approached, dealt with. Because it seems to me, if we talk about no to lithium, but keep using phones, et cetera, then, then we are living a contradiction. And i like to know how, how this is addressed. Because um, yes, there may be cheaper way of producing, uh, better way, not cheaper, sorry, <laughs> better way of producing uh, mobile phones. But, uh, but this is an issue that I don't think is enough addressed. And I want to know if there's a discussion of, we talk about changing our life. We need to not only think of, uh, you know, uh, a different kind of energy a program, but also the need to change our life, the need to change. So has there been a discussion? Uh, maybe, maybe from the, well, let's, let's see if it, we can, um, it's a difficult um, answer, of course, of course. But I think it 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 um, in Latin America, for example, um, we've been discussing a lot about green knowledge around the process of producing communication and communication technologies. 
and I think it has to do with property of knowledge. Uh, also, the, the um, obsolescencia programada, um, for example, demanding for lost uh, for lasting technologies and technology that can be used beyond uh, the limits of of a kind of of the the modern and um, economy. And also, it has to do with all those things. As I think, as Hevi said, it it has to do with thinking about the scale of technologies are embedded and use and production, and of course, the 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 how much they last. Also, so there are interesting uh, discussions here, especially with the. Um, um, el movimiento por software libres, uh, open knowledge movements, for example, that are trying to put all those aspects into the the, um, the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if someone else could add some, uh, about this, which is I consider is very important. And another aspect very, very quickly is that as Pancha said, the problem with the, the transition hegemonic technologies is that they are uh, at the service of industries and not at the service of communities. In many spaces where they are established, they uh, or energy is not used for community, is used for industry and corporations and also the same model. So this is a limit and it's a dispute also. It's not that we are against new technologies or that we are against of, 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 of um, those technologies that the use we are giving to the energy, for example, the, um, the different reproduction of the commons that they are, of course, mediating, uh, of course. And this is a very important point, uh, energy for people. To whom? To people for reprodu life reproduction and not uh, hegemonic economical capitalist production. Yeah. And, and sorry, oh, go ahead. Pero no sé si hay traducción. Me avisan. Un segundito. Okay. Ya, déjame. Muy breve, son reflexiones que me cruzan los de Catarina, Victoria, Silvia, en lo que habla Liliana. No hay minería sostenible, no hay minería es muy importante para nosotras y nosotros decirlo, pero sí pensar en etapas y en urgencia respecto a transitar más allá del extractivismo. Por ejemplo, nosotras hablamos de minería de lo indispensable y eso indispensable es sostener la vida, no minería para las ganancias. Entonces siempre nos dicen lo mismo. Entonces, ¿ustedes no quieren que tengamos celulares? No. Queremos que haya celulares, pero uno en tu vida. <ríe> o sea, que tenga la posibilidad de una durabilidad, de un uso tecnológico, pensado no en el favor de las ganancias, sino el poder sostener nuestros buenos vivires. Y les aseguro que esas minas que estamos hablando de litio van a quedar reducidas a su mínima expresión, porque hoy la producción del litio está en la lógica de la generación de ganancias, no de la calidad de vida de las personas, no de nuestra conectividad. De hecho, también hay experiencias maravillosas en México de eh, comunidades de celulares comunitarios. Mm. Ah. Y además, es muy importante, y eso decimos, nuestra lucha además es que los pueblos estemos en todo el ejercicio en la producción, distribución y consumo, dentro de esta lógica de nuestra calidad de vida, de buenos vivir, entonces otra visión, y por eso nosotras y nosotros decimos, aquí la urgencia es seguir lo mismo de siempre, derrocar al capitalismo, y ahí el cambio 
urgente de la matriz productiva, energética y de consumo. No queremos que haya explotación del litio en Portugal. Uh -huh. De hecho, justamente lo que hablamos, y por eso ya con esto termino, hablamos de territorios en sacrificio. ¿Por qué? Porque nosotras hemos logrado frenar proyecto extractivo, explotación del litio. Pero mientras se produzca, se mantenga la misma matriz productiva energética de consumo, ese proyecto que logramos votar se va a levantar en otro territorio. Por eso hablamos en sacrificio, porque todos los territorios son sacrificables en relación a la lógica del capital. Entonces, esto es una lucha global y un cambio de vida, de paradigma. Es una profunda reflexión sobre lo económico también. Entonces, es importante ver esta dimensión entretejida. Eso quería decir. Thank you. And may I also add something, Francia, and also responding to Silvia. And, and this idea of sacrifice, I think it's important because, and it has to do with the ecological depth that we've talked also. I think there's people that have been sacrificing too. So it's not only territories, but people. And if you think about people who don't have an option but to take a bath once a week, right? So there's people already doing these practices by need, but there needs to be a profound sacrifice from the global north. And that's what I think we're demanding too. We've been sacrificing so far in the global south. How is the global north going to sacrifice now? by using only one cell phone in their life, by reducing their water consumption, by reducing and degrowth, basically, I think it's an important word too. So it's kind of a reciprocal sacrifice that we are demanding because we're in the South, or, you know, sacrificing our territories, our bodies, our children, our health, our culture, uh, because we know we have to do it. And sometimes because we don't have an option, right? How do you bring this question to someone in Navajo or Diné territory here in the United States that don't even have water access? You know, the sacrifice is there already. They don't have an option but to take a shower once a week or something. So that's something I've been thinking about, um, you know, this kind of original contracts, you know, of sacrificing. It has to do with natural law, I think so too. Yeah, Nico. Um, but anyways, I'll leave it at that and, and thank you for, for the space. Thank you so much. I think we are living with this um, indication, I, I, I may say. I think this last comment and this last uh, difficult question, how to navigate this time, how can we really personally and collectively produce some change? I think in a way the, the degrowth that at one point was a perspective suggested by some, now it's becoming a necessity for all of us in our planetary home. And I think it's very uh, empowering this, um, this direction that we could, we can all uh, be engaged in this change if we start to share more the means that we have, if uh, one cell phone can serve a whole community, one computer to avoid us also taking an airplane to be part of a conference and using one computer to be on a Zoom conversation could be a way to be more, uh, um, more uh, aware about what we use and for what. Also in organizing our struggle in a globalized world. So I, I would uh, maybe close here, thanking all of you for being present and especially the, our contributors for being so generous about sharing uh, their, their preoccupation, their practices, uh, their analysis, their ongoing research. Thank you so much, Liliana, Francisca, Silvia, and Ibis for, for sharing, and all of you for being here. As Silvia suggested, let's please be in touch through the reimagining um, conference. We can share our contact, share our text. It will be our duty to reorganize some of the material and be in touch. To, to circulate the recording and eventually transcribing. And I think uh, this is a conversation that only started. 
at least among all of us, and it's uh, very important to continue. So all to all of you who are doing incredible work of regeneration, of resisting, of re-existing in your territories for keeping the struggle going. Thank you so much from, from heart to heart. And we keep going. Gracias, muchas gracias. Bye to everybody. Bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Muy thank you. Muy agradecida. Andrea, thank you. Bye. Take care. Gracias, Cari, por la traducción. De transcripción. Sandra. Gracias, Francisca, qué hermoso todo lo que hablas. Y gracias a usted la traducción. Y, y Liliana, tú estás en Ecuador. No, yo estoy en Caracas, yo estoy en Caracas ah, ya, ya, ya. y estoy en el Observatorio de Ecología Política allí y en otras, otras articulaciones, así que estamos a la orden y les mantenemos al, al informe también de los, las siguientes conversas, cosas para hacer juntas respecto a, a esta iniciativa Sur Sur.